to conclude the basic discussion of the central dogma, I just want to, 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 to give an example of how we could uh, uh, imagine the journey starting from the DNA down to the protein. And um, I am doing this because I noticed that in my previous recordings, I wasn't really that uh, uh, specific with the letters, uh, how they transform from one step of the central dogma to another. And, and uh, I just want to, 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 to record this to make things clear. So, of course, our starting point in the central dogma is DNA. And then, of course, we assume that because uh, uh, we need to have more copies of the DNA prior to cell division, there should be replication. So we just assume that replication is going to happen. But even if I try to replicate this entire strand right here, the fact that we replicate it means that we will get the same exact strand, right? So now, of course, after replication, and we have this strand still right here, the next step of the central dogma is transcription, wherein we use, uh, we, we assume that this right here is our template strand or anti-sense strand in order to generate our mRNA strand. That's why notice um, I started with the three prime N for my DNA because I know that when I make my RNA strand, elongation should be, uh, and I taught this right, elongation should follow the direction five prime to, to, to three prime. Actually, I don't know what's going on with the. Uh, I think <coughs> I wrote something here, but let me just clean this up. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, our RNA after transcription, okay, should elongate from five to three prime. Now notice the letters here. Again, remember our base pairs for DNA are 80 and CG. But remember, since in RNA, there is no more thymine, we replace that base pair with AU. That is to say, these two may be called the Watson-Crick base pairs. We've discussed this in the properties of the double helix. But the AT base pair, of course, is non-existent in RNA because there is no T. So we instead replace it with the AU pair, although the CG is actually uh, left unchanged. So. That is to say, if I have T from the DNA, we know that what's supposed to be paired to that is A. Now, is there an A in RNA? Of course. So for, for every T in DNA, you convert that to A. So notice that in every thymine, I write in my RNA equivalent as A. A, where's T? A, A, yeah. So every T has been converted to A. But, this time, uh, since, okay, for example, I have A. In DNA, I'm supposed to pair A to T, right? But again, in RNA, we replace it with U. That means for every A in the DNA, when I write the RNA equivalent, I should instead write U. U, U, U. Uh, all of this would be U, U, and that's it, okay? So, so far, uh, I hope we're good with this. And then, of course, since the CG base pair is constant in both DNA and RNA, it's very easy to understand that for every G, we have C. For every C, we have G. So as you can see, we just, you know, follow all of it. Nothing really special at this point. Okay. So the moment that I finally, you know, transcribe all of this, into the RNA. Remember that, of course, depending on the question, it may the one you have here may be already the mRNA, but of course, it could be the hnRNA if this was a eukaryotic example. Okay, and of course, uh, since eukaryotic RNA has a lot of introns, we have to remember that introns are going to be removed later on after splicing. That is to say. If I successfully splice this HNRNA, if we assume this is HNRNA, I'm gonna get rid of all of the introns. And then the remaining exons, I will just write straight up. So as you notice, we now have the only exons in our final mRNA sample, ACC, GUA, UAC, GGC, GGG. Okay. And of course, uh, since this is already like the entire coding region, all we have to do in translation is to, uh, again, we should get our 64 codon table. 
I, I would be providing a link below. And then all you have to do is to find the codons for uh, this. I mean, the code, these codons on that table. So ACC, GUA, UAC, GGC, GGG. And then uh, I already did that before recording this. So ACC actually stands for thymine, GUA for valine, UAC for tyrosine. Both of these are degenerate. Um, they are both glycine. And take note that the five prime end in the mRNA is actually equivalent to the end terminus in the protein, which is, I think it's, it's, it's poetic justice because uh, I, again, I always tell in the previous recordings that five prime is like the head portion and then three prime is the back portion or the foot portion. And we always remember also read proteins starting from the end terminus and always end at the C terminus, okay? So they are like parallels. The five prime end is like our N terminus equivalent and the three prime end is our C terminus equivalent. Now, if I don't know really how your teacher would ask questions, if it's like the one I'm giving as an example here, but uh, I think one thing that you should be very careful um, about uh, uh, problems like this is uh, knowing your uh, ends. Because uh, if you, for example, if you mistakenly assume that this one is going to be like from the five prime to three prime end, then all your codons here will be reversed. And since, for example, if you reverse ACC, it becomes CCA. And we know that uh, it, it, that might not code for the same amino acid. That might be a disaster leading you to a very, very different final peptide. So uh, just be sure that your ends, your five prime and three prime ends are not uh, inverted as you answer the question invert it when necessary. Like for example, when I create my RNA from DNA, I should follow the anti-parallel rule. But once I splice it, since I'm just cutting the entrance out, I preserve the five prime end. Because if you don't observe the proper uh, ends, again, you might end up having a very, very different answer.